acting a lot like they were acting. First of all, is Newton. So Newton is a great uh, role model for his work on Kipia. And so how did he deal with these things? Uh, did he, have, he didn't have a lab, he didn't directly collect data, he used the data from previous scientists, Kepler, Galileo, and so on. So he didn't collect the data, essentially, not much anyway. And he idealized a huge amount and could out the equations of motion. Uh, you could say uh, they're pretty uh, good, uh, pretty realistic about the cosmos and astronomy. But when it comes to uh, down-to-earth applications, like an apple fall falling, uh, it falls very, very short of being uh, accurate model. It's an idealized model because of friction. Friction uh, is part of uh, every application, engineering application, every application, I say, on the Earth, essentially, of uh, Newton's equations. And it took 100 years before <coughs> friction was incorporated in the Newton's equation. So in that respect, in basic respect, Newton was idealized tremendously. And that was good. That was a big feature of his work, his idealization. So for me, that was a very big inspiration. OK, Von uh, I mentioned, because he was doing uh, the mathematical foundations of quantum physics. Quantum physics was really, really developed, of course, by physicists. But uh, von Neumann put, put all this together using mathematics into uh, frameworks, which eventually did a lot of operators and Hilbert spaces, and did a huge solidity to quantum mechanics and a big path for this development. Yeah, so uh, one aspect of this is just the concept of Hilbert space. I don't think too many people appreciate that von Neumann introduced the concept of the Hilbert space, literally and uh, exactly. And that, of course, not only important for quantum mechanics, it's important for central for all, all, almost all functional analysis. And that was von Neumann's uh, way of making uh, the foundations Quantum mechanics. Again, von Neumann at this stage was not doing experiments, not making predictions in uh, quantum mechanics. He left that to the, the physicists, and he used the results of the physicists and put it together with his beautiful foundations, uh, or set a Hilbert space, and his operators played a central role, and still plays a huge role in physics today. Okay. Uh, Third inspiration is uh, Watson and Crick, uh, who uh, found the double helix. Again, they didn't do laboratory work either. They used the experiments of others, especially Rosman and Franklin. Uh, and they idealized that aspect of the double helix. Nowadays, it's seen as a, it's a typical iceberg. Uh, the main thing the double helix is uses protein. The model now uses proteins around the chromosome. So the double helix is wrapped around a uh, structure of double histone proteins. So that's a very far cry from uh, Watson Crick. And then not only is the double helix wrapped around that, that gives it a lot of its form and everything else. Uh, these core histones, these proteins, uh, that play such a big role understanding the DNA today. So all that was absence in uh, Watson Crick. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a great, great work. This uh, idealization which uh, did not take into account these main ingredients, proteins. Uh, yeah, so uh, Watson and Crick, I should uh, mention, they published their work uh, in a uh, uh, address to a chemist. When I was a student, the biologists were divided into two, two parts. One was zoology, and the other is botany, the 
plant biologist and an uh, animal biologist, and they had no interest whatsoever in uh, things like DNA. So Wasson Crick addressed the chemists in their, uh, their main papers. And eventually, 10 years later, uh, got picked up by uh, other scientists and got recognized. It took a long time before Watson Crick was really recognized. Because the biologists didn't care about it, and it took for a while for chemists to absorb it. All right. Uh, so, but let me go back a little bit to von Neumann. Uh, von Neumann uh, had an interesting role in things that go beyond uh, his foundations of uh, quantum mechanics. He became a very important figure in the development of the computer at uh, Princeton, the Institute for Max Study. And I remember, uh, again, mathematicians didn't recognize it. Again, I mentioned Ralph Bach because I think he was a great mathematician, but he represented to a great extent the mathematics of that time. Uh, and so uh, we talked about von Neumann and, uh, and Bach. It's really emphasized how unimportant von Neumann was. Uh, and that, but that reflected the opinions at the Institute for Advanced Study, where von Neumann had a job, and to a great extent, much of the mainstream mathematics community. Uh, I gave a talk around von Neumann and Ann Arbor. University of Michigan just a few weeks ago. And uh, in the audience was his daughter, Marie von Neumann, who I had never met. So uh, after my talk, she came up and introduced herself. And she said, uh, my picture of von Neumann was extremely accurate. He was really had a huge problem with all his colleagues at the Institute for Advanced Study. And I knew that when he died, he immediately emptied his office threw away all of his computers. But she said more than that, they uh, the, the, the institute as a petition, uh, passed new bylaws which would prevent in the future them from ever hiring anybody not going on. And that's what his daughter said. Okay, so uh, let me go on now to uh, the last person, uh, Turing. So what about Turing? How, how does he fit here? Well, uh, I spent quite a lot of time working on Turing's uh, models and developing them. Turing uh, was, a, I think, a really a great mathematician, uh, but his models using zeros and ones, uh, his Turing machines, suffered a lot because they uh, cannot deal with scientific computation. Scientific computation leaves concepts of condition. And uh, that's not part of Turing's framework. In fact, uh, in the last year or two of his life, von Neumann uh, realized this and wrote accordingly some paper where he said one needs to talk about condition for basically for computation. Turing machines don't deal with such a basic uh, object in scientific computation. So again, uh, Turing was idealizing, a great idealization, the Turing machine was a far cry what's really uh, required for a very general theories of computation, scientific computation, very separate from the numerical analysts uh, uh, who, you know, last I heard, they had no use for Turing. Uh, you know, I think Turing was a great inspiration myself, but one has to see that it, had uh, limits and did this great computation, idealizing tremendously about computation. Okay, uh, so those are uh, some of the little bit of reflections I've been doing about my own my own work. All right, now how do I uh, stand now in biology? How, do, how does that work? So uh, I'm working now uh, for maybe two or three years, say, 
in genome biology, the biology of the genome. I started out, uh, before that, I was working uh, with Tony Pozio in vision. We had some models of vision, uh, machine vision, which were uh, inspired partly by studying the brain. Huber and Weasel. Or, uh, so that, that had to do with uh, things that were strings of, uh, you know, there, there were two-dimensional images that weren't used in our model. So they had these patches of vision we put them together. Uh, so you think of those as pixels, uh, sets of pixels, two dimensions, kind of two dimension. And so uh, actually I was at a computer science institute where I worked for many years, eight years. I was a, essentially a computer scientist, but as far as colleagues in the uh, and workplace goes. But uh, I heard a number of talks on uh, DNA, on uh, proteins, and uh, transcription, uh, transcription uh, factors based on strings of letters. The proteins, which I heard a lot about, the strings of letters of a certain alphabet of amino acids, about 20 amino acids. So a protein could be described so again by a string of these uh, amino acids. That's characteristic of a uh, protein. So this is a little bit like what I was doing in vision, except it was much, much simpler. It was just a uh, one-dimensional patch with the uh, alphabet of just 20 prescribed letters, much simpler than uh, what I was working with the uh, vision uh, alphabet, which was two-dimensional, and moreover, you don't have a compacted by, like, 20 elements, because you have to use these people with these little patches, and they're less defined. So then I said, it's much better for me to switch over to uh, biology, because there we can see these things much more uh, clearly, and uh, our analysis should carry over. Okay, so uh, that's what happened. So that was maybe six, seven, seven years ago. I was at City University in Hong Kong, and I put together a group where they gave me a lot of support there. So I put together uh, financial resources to put together a group of five to ten people, maybe more. Uh, we would learn the biology together. So there were some people who uh, in this group who knew some good biology. But uh, they weren't, there weren't any biologists, per se, in my group. But uh, together, what we did was we were uh, looking at immunology and trying to understand what are good uh, vaccines by testing them on the relative to various uh, aspects of the uh, genes, MHC. OK, so uh, we learned the biology. And some main elements, especially for me, was to uh, learn the biology by uh, using Google. So uh, Google was my main method for learning. So I had to come in from a very weak background. And Google is a fantastic resource. I think the best. You see, using Google today when I'm studying the, uh, the genome, various aspects of the genome, and I can just look right my questions now I, I add what I would normally ask a biologist, uh, but I would uh, have to find the right biologist to ask the question too. So I write it down, short, I give it to Google. And I've got a huge display of information, you know, really directed at my question. Definitions, other resources. So uh, that, that was the way I could get into uh, a new subject like biology was to take advantage of Google. When I was young, I did the other same kind of thing. And that day, I would go to the library and come home with a whole armful of books on the subject. And I looked through the books to, to learn to scan them. And I would do that again and again. But now, I do it so I find all that literature, a couple of papers, everything. So that really sped uh, my learning uh, into the uh, Okay, so uh, 
These days, then, I'm working with somebody in Vega Rajapaksa from Ceylon. Uh, we've written three papers together, and I'm working on a fourth paper right now. I'll be talking about those tomorrow at the Graduate Center. And uh, so I've been to uh, we have talked maybe three times by now in the medical school. Uh, and math to the medical school in that hour. So that's a uh, you know, great resource. But Indica has a lab, so that's good. We uh, you know, we're talking about these experiments, probably that, that's helpful. But the main thing still for me is looking up the experiments that other people have done. And they, they, of course, they have data in those papers, but more than that, they use that data to collect it into some kind of biological theme or biological thesis. So they've been not only given, given me the data, they've given me its application to help understand its role and uh, how to relate different genes, for example. OK. so. Uh, yeah, that's just a little bit. And uh, at some point, we start, I started out with immunology and biology. That was four or five years ago. And the problem of what are the good uh, potential vaccines to use? How do you, uh, you, you use a lot of data analysis, what we call learning theory or machine learning, to recognize what are especially the bad candidates for a vaccine? Is that this cuts out a huge amount of work for the uh, companies that produce vaccines. They can exclude a huge number of these cuts by short strings and proteins. And they narrow them down. That's the main thing that these experiments uh, accomplish. In our group, uh, well, we started out like, slowly, but at one point then our members of our group used these things to win an international prize. Uh, Okay, so uh, that was uh, before I switched over to uh, the genome. Genome, let me remind you, is a set of genes, and I'm talking about mainly human genes. So I'm looking at a set of human genes, and they've been uh, listed now. Listed, they know exactly what are the human genes. Genes, how they are labeled, the labeling uh, by amino uh, acid strings, for example. These are protein uh, producing genes. Uh, but, but so they know, they are very well known. All the genes are, human genes are, are quite well known. But uh, the genes really uh, are affecting each other. So you know, the list. It's not a very good uh, final, uh, final uh, description of the genes. If I know all the uh, different uh, atoms, the chemicals in my hand, it doesn't say much about my hand. It's how they fit together. So that's what uh, is our uh, picture of studying the genome. We want to see how these genes fit together, how they work together with, uh, with other genes, how they compare work in a coordinated way. So uh, that's uh, the motivation for studying the genome. And so for doing, doing that, what we did uh, in our first paper was to think of a formal uh, description of this genome, uh, set of genes, but the gene, genes are uh, labeled especially by their, what they're doing Culture, uh, uh, expression levels. So the, the space of states are the expression levels of the set of genes. They're just positive real numbers of concentration. So you have a dynamics. The goal is to get a dynamics on the space concentration levels of the genes. And that's just a you know, co coordinate, coordinates of positive uh, entries in Euclidean space. So well, that forms a uh, state space for dynamics. And what we did in that first paper is for, uh, formally write down the dynamical system. 
Well, that's what, uh, what we did, was to write down the differential equations for the gene expressions, for the human genome, or for more broadly the genomes in general. And it uh, goes back to uh, differential equations, which were used in biology for 100 years, called health functions. And so we use uh, a lot of existing biology, but we put it together in a uh, to obtain a formal dynamics uh, for the genome. And uh, it was uh, in this dynamics formalized that we could write down examples from biology using our formal dynamics. And uh, the dynamics was formally defined uh, for, for all the, for the, the whole system of genome, the 20,000 genomes. Uh, Proteins, for example. Okay, so once one has that, that leads to a, a lot of possibilities. This is all now with uh, extreme idealizations. This dynamic is an extreme idealization. We're based especially on what are called transcription factors. And these color equations I mentioned. Okay, so uh, let's see. So, this picture uh, of this dynamics uh, leads to other concepts uh, which become mathematically uh, well defined, again, uh, with a lot of uh, idealization in biology, like a cell. So, what is a cell? Now we have a description and mathematical formulation of a cell. A cell is made up. Uh, primarily, the constituents are proteins. And it's the proteins that give a function of <coughs> the cell. So uh, what we do is postulate uh, the, the dynamics is a globally stable equilibrium dynamics with this equilibrium. Now uh, the uh, expression levels can also be expressed as proteins. So the, the proteins, uh, the, the proteins uh, concentration from the proteins uh, form the equilibrium state. And now we can say, let's just go look at this equilibrium state. We have to make it more uh, extensive when we talk about uh, periodic solutions which are stable. But we're just looking at the equilibrium states. And that will define a notion of an equilibrium distribution of the proteins. Okay, so now we can say a cell uh, is described by its main constituents, which are the proteins at equilibrium of its genome dynamics, in the cell dynamics. <coughs> okay, once one can do that, then uh, it paves the way for uh, a lot of things. So now we characterize cells as these distribution of proteins. And now look at a tissue of the body. Uh, tissue, you can say, is a uh, unit of cells, like the liver, the heart, heart muscle. These are all cells of the same, similar, of the similar kind. And so one can postulate, as we do, that a tissue is a uh, Union of cells of the same cell type. Okay, this is not far from the biologists say, but we now say cell type is defined as the equilibrium distributions of proteins in that dynamics of that uh, cell. So now, to this, uh, to work for the body, we want to have the cells work in unison. So we have. Uh, have to say, how are these cells going to work in unison? Uh, you have millions of cells of tissue and heart. And how do they all come together to work in unison? And so our uh, picture was to get some kind of model for uh, what we call emergence. And so the cells give the function. And for the cells to function, they have to have similar proteins. So we want, we want, our papers call sometimes the 
emergence of function has to be that. So the emergence of function is something we want to give some justification for in terms of the things I've talked about. Some kind of mathematical foundation of justification for this concept of emergence of function. Okay, uh, so what we do is go back to Turing, Turing's model of morphogenesis. After uh, his last years of his life, he wrote, uh, made a uh, remarkable computation. We talked about, uh, as I said, uh, uh, these ideas which uh, weren't addressed by his Turing machines. Uh, he also wrote a paper on morphogenesis, how uh, you know, patterns and how uh, the ideas to try to understand how things develop in biology, even biology. Okay, so in uh, this picture, what he does is to take a model of what he calls cells, uh, they aren't exactly biological cells, but there's some kind of cells, and there's some kind of dynamics in the, uh, each cell. Uh, he was assuming linear dynamics, which is very limiting because you can't really construct the notion of a stable equilibrium, uh, which is robust and uh, linear dynamics. But he was using linear dynamics. Then he was using diffusion between the cells. Okay, so uh, you have two cells, the joining cells, they have a membrane, and you have diffusion through that membrane again, gross idealization. But uh, he created the system of equations, linear in his case, where you have diffusion between the cells, and on each cell you have these chemical reactions, which I would call the uh, gene dynamics. Okay, so that was Turing's model way back in 1952.
hire an applied mathematician. Uh -huh. He said the question doesn't make sense. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. You know, it's exactly my language. My language, I just expressed in this talk. Well, applied mathematics, but I should say that there is a lot of uh, applied mathematics that doesn't fit what I do. Certainly, most, maybe almost all. Uh, there is a kind of applied mathematics where they do have some models, but those models are built mostly for uh, the gold prediction. And that you can find insights like I do with the structures and so on. So uh, you can make some sense out of applied math, and that sense, <laughs> one, good, one sense is what I just said. Another sense is maybe more traditional, where you don't really uh, look for structures, you don't look for uh, heavy idealizations and such things as that. That's probably the main way applied mathematics is practiced. There is something called applied math. I don't essentially the same thing. Yes. Because of my idealizations, it doesn't do uh, more 
find things. But the hope is that these idealizations together with the structures get in new insights into the field. And the current paper surely has done that. And we, you know, all the other four people I've mentioned, we get new insights. To say the least. And that's why I think our part do we get new insights from what we're doing? Thank you. 